Then tell me when you're ready. Okay. Um, there's some seats here. You can sit here. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to uh, today's Diploma Honors Presentations. Uh, my name is Manishe Verghese, and I'm the head of public engagement at the AA. So I work on the public program, which is lots of lectures, exhibitions, and special projects. Um, that happen pretty much most evenings in this room. It's been a while since I've stood here in front of a packed lecture hall rather than on a Zoom screen, so it's very exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, and I also teach a diploma unit here at the AA. But uh, this AA, event so is an annual occurrence. I work on the public uh, program, the, which always happens at the start of every year. And in addition to working and teaching here, I also studied here. And I kind of remember sitting in your seats many years ago. Um, and during my own introduction week and watching the honor students at the time uh, present their projects. And I think I had like a mixture of kind of excitement and panic in my stomach at the time, um, whether I'd ever be able to do a project like theirs. And, uh, but I think you'll find that um, they all felt like that as well during their own introduction week. Um, and here they are today as AA graduates ready to discuss their projects and present them to you. So, to tell you a bit about Diploma Honours, um, it's the highest award you can achieve on graduating from the AA, uh, from the five-year accredited program. Um, and up to one fifth-year student per diploma unit gets nominated at our final year tables. And um, then it's like on the penultimate Friday of the academic year, um, they all do a 10-minute presentation um, to the all the diploma tutors. And they talk about the kind of value, relevance, and the premise of their project. And uh, the tutors then go away to vote on who would get diploma honors. And um, the, the, the projects are then announced, followed by much celebration, which last year finally returned to the AA Terrace. Um, and it's one of my favorite days of the year because you get to see a real, real cross-section throughout the school. And the whole school comes to kind of watch the presentations and participate. And uh, yeah, so it's a nice kind of way to bookend the year that we end the year with the diploma presentations and then start a new year by seeing those same projects again. Um, so six projects this year were awarded diploma with honors and they really manifest the breadth of interests across the school. Um, I'll give a brief summary, but then they'll each do their 10 minute presentations for you. Um, so Sinan from Diploma 14 reinserts the patio into the Kachia Badi or the squatter settlements of Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, Elam proposes a new agricultural framework of temporary ownership, interdependent strip strips of land and retrofitted users in Brittany and France. Uh, James sets in motion a practice positioning the architect as mediator between human and non-human worlds, which he tests within brownfield sites over 200 years across London. Thomas looked to transform the architecture of the house from a complicit weapon and place of violence into a safe space as a home of refuge for survivors of domestic abuse, while Amaya becomes the material broker connecting a material reseller with a demolition contractor to ensure the reclamation of York Stone paving from a demolition on Fleet Street in London. And Tetsuya introduces a new horticultural community in a former coal field in response to the leveling up white paper issued by the UK government in 2022 as an alternative um, architectural approach for collective living in rural conditions. So today, um, Thomas, James, Tetsuya, and Sinan are here to present their projects to you. And Amaya has sent a pre-recorded presentation because she's not in London. Um, Elam, unfortunately, is not able to be here today, but we'll hopefully bring her in at some point later in the year to present her project. Um, and yeah, after the presentations, there'll be time to ask questions. So um, you can ask them about their projects, about the process of working on them, and uh, kind of what they might be doing next. So you can think of some good questions while they're presenting. Um, so I'll first, uh, I guess, we'll first play Amaya's video from Diploma 18, um, which will then be followed by Thomas from Diploma 1. Um, I've forgotten my order now. Um, 
James from Diploma 12, Sinan from Diploma 14, and then Tetsuya from Diploma 15. So over to Amaya on screen. No, no. <laughs> Hello, my name is Amaya Mandes, and my project is called Sisyphus and Napoleon Stone. I'm sorry that I could not be in the room with you guys today presenting, but I hope you enjoy the presentation anyway. So the presentation is split up into four parts, and we begin with a prelude. The demolition site I chose to focus on for my thesis is the Salisbury Square demolition. Situated in Fleet Street, the demolition comprised of nine buildings total, and it will make way for the City of London's new justice quarters designed by Eric Perry Architects. As a unit exercise, we were asked to make a material audit with all materials that we believe to have reused potential on site. Eager to know if these materials had any value in the reclamation market, I decided to give some reclamation dealers a call to find out. Can you guys still take London Spot? So after contacting eight dealers, I took the opportunity to send them the material audits that was previously made, and I helped the interested resellers schedule site visits with the demolition contractors directly. As a result, 500 meters squared of Yorkstone paving were reclaimed from site. as well as some doors and cast iron railings. It was a bit surprising to me that it took an overly enthusiastic architecture student to connect the reseller with the demolition contractors to ensure the reclamation of the Yorkstone paving. Surely this had to be somebody else's responsibility on site, no? But after looking at an endless list of consultants for demolition sites, I realized that there is no one actor who is responsible in overseeing the reclamation of materials. Apparently not even the on-site sustainability manager, as one of the site managers told me I had done more in a week to reclaim materials than their sustainability manager had done in a month. Perhaps this is due to the incredibly vague job description inside, which mentions something about the implementation of sustainable strategies, which can really mean a lot of different things. What I propose is an incredibly specific job description, a new consultant in the building industry that I am calling the material broker. A material broker facilitates negotiations between material resellers, demolition contractors, architects, and their clients to promote the reclamation of our existing building stock. Ensuring material salvage is the sole responsibility of this consultant, and of course, everything that comes with it. The reason why this is such a crucial role is because many material reuse ambitions start out quite strong, but are left to the stamina of the other actors in the ecosystem Inertia takes hold and the actors become increasingly busy and the reuse ambitions begin to crumble until there are none left. This is why the material broker role as a mediator would be beneficial in making an active change in the building industry. When it comes to reuse, the actors in the ecosystem will revolve around the material broker, easing logistics, storage and reclamation procedures, as well as salvaged material procurement for anyone involved. So, not only had I been conceptually developing this new role, but throughout my whole final academic year, I had actively been performing as one. First, with reclamation of the Yorkstone paving. Second, with the attempted reclamation of the Portland stone found on both 80 and 71 Fleet Street. The reason why I chose the Portland stone facade over any other material was because when looking into the planning application documents, 
I found that there were written intentions brought forward by the City of London to reclaim the Portland Stone without downcycling for on or off site use. It's kind of a big deal that these ambitions were made their way into the planning application documents in the first place. However, upon further investigation, I understood that there were there was no one actually doing anything to find interested buyers, and I was clearly not having any of that. From this moment on, I took it upon myself to help the Celts Bray and the City of London reclaim the Portland Stone facade. The diagram you see on the screen is a representation of what I did towards reclaiming the stone throughout my whole academic year. I have sent 93 emails, made 38 phone calls, 22 site visits, and, and have over five hours of audio recordings from various interviews. I have talked to stone conservationists, stone masons, stone enthusiasts, geologists, resellers, demolition contractors, demolition operatives, sustainability managers, architects, and their receptionists. I have met eccentric artists living in Portland that like to call me at 10 p.m. on Sunday with questions regarding the stone. I've contacted businesses from established quarries to random people on Facebook. One architect even informed me that someone might have marked my email as spam, probably because I was sending too many mass emails to the city of London trying to get their attention. And this, by the way, was our email thread after that. And although there is no denying that the process of finding prospective buyers has been tumultuous at best, the tactics and formats I have resorted to to get people's attention to see the potential in the stone has been an integral part in the formation of the full job description. And I'd like to briefly explain a sort of life and day in the life of a material broker. When I was thinking of who could potentially reclaim the stones, I thought the most obvious contact was Eric Perry architects themselves, as they, along with the city of London, have decided to demolish a Portland stone building and replace it with a Portland stone building. My first ambition was to convince them to reintegrate the existing Portland stone into their new scheme, but I couldn't just send them photos like I had done with the previous resellers because I knew that all that they would see was a whole lot of ornament, which clearly clashes with the Eric Perry cool aesthetic. Or does it? What better way to convince architects than through design? My theory was that if I designed the stone reintegration well enough into their new scheme and presented it to them, that they would be so impressed and want to salvage the stones themselves. After categorizing the stones from 80 and 71 Fleet Street, I chose three moments in the Eric Perry existing scheme that I saw fit for reclaimed stone. I added reclaimed ashlar to the inscription land. Our deco pilasters to the bay windows in the back facade, which just so happened to be the same proportions of what they were going to propose anyway. And the wall for the main entrance made from reconfigured pilasters, assuming that they are devoid of intasis. I then packaged the drawings and sent them to the architects as an actual proposal for them to consider. But after meeting with them, they informed me that the project was too far along to make any changes. I then realized that design should be an integral part of the material broker's toolkit. So I repeated the exercise for three further projects to try to convince architects to salvage the Fleet Street stones. Every time attempting to inf infiltrate not only their architectural, their style of architecture, but their planning application documents as well, as to help them envision the stones into their own project with ease. Now I sadly don't have time to talk about all of the designs, but I hope but my hope is that through reuse, we can also bring back a dwindling craft of building with stone ashlar, as well as re-exploring the possibilities of working with cyclopline lime cement construction. No cladding here. <laughs> as a material broker, I also wish to help promote and bring attention to and bring attention and clients to the existing resellers in the country. 
by also providing them with design assistance and contacts. So where do we go from here? In terms of the reclamation of the stone, as of now, now being now meaning when I had first presented this project, this had only had this had been the only stone reclaimed by me. And as nice as it looked on the plinth uh, from the honors presentation, my ambition is still to offer it to Studio Weave and reintegrate it back into the city. In the last version of this presentation, uh, it involved me saying that in case Studio Weave didn't manage to reclaim stones from site, there was still hope that the eccentric artist from Portland would reclaim the entrance to 8081 Fleet Street and bring it back to Portland as they showed a lot of interest in my interviews with them. And this is exactly what ended up happening. Uh, in a short email from Robert Greer, a contact at Pay Stoneworks, he informed me that um, the Portland Stone, the Portland Stone and Quarry Trust will officially reclaim the entrance stones to 80, 80 and 81 Fleet Street. Um, and this is what their drawings actually look like. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any images or videos yet of the dismantling as it took place uh, at the beginning of this month. Um, but I can keep you guys posted, whoever is interested in seeing that. Um, and in terms of where the material broker is going, uh, I have secured a job with the reclamation dealer Retruvius and have been asked by them to further develop the role of the material broker for the benefit of the company. And I've also been on the lookout for architecture firms I can infiltrate with a genuine interest in applying this research. Um, and at least that is still the plan uh, for when my holiday ends. Um, and I'd like to leave you with this. Where demand does not yet exist, it can be sparked. And where supply is lacking, it can be encouraged. If anyone has any further questions, um, I obviously can't answer them now because I'm not in the room, but uh, you can email me. Uh, that's my actual email on my business card. Um, and yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, Manage asked us to say a couple of words perhaps that could help some new students. And I think the biggest thing that I took away from the AA was to just commit to your project. I mean, first to choose a topic that you are truly interested in because you're going to be dealing with it for the entire year. So it's a bit torture not really being interested in the topic. Uh, so first, be sure to really choose something that you are really interested in and can't wait to like sink your teeth in. And then the second is just to commit fully. I have seen amazing projects that you would think Maybe the elevator pitch wasn't amazing, but the student committed themselves 100% to the project and it ended up being amazing. And, and I think at the AA, this is really valued and it's really um, promoted. So I think if I had advice, that would be my advice because that's what I did and it somehow ended me with an honors, uh, which I didn't ever really think that I would have. So. That's, I think, all for me. Uh, but yeah, like I said, if anyone has any questions, feel free to email me or find me on Facebook, whatever it is. Anyway, enjoy the rest of the presentations and uh, have a good day. Um, yeah, hello everyone. I remember very well um, on my first week 
seeing the honours presentations and thinking how incredible they were. I still don't think that my project fits within that category, so something's happened along the way, but um, yeah, I think the others do, so hopefully you can still get something from today. Um, just to say that my project um, has a triggering nature to it, so if anybody needs to step out at any point, then please do feel free to do so. Thank you. He would trap me in the kitchen or somewhere so I couldn't escape. And uh, he would, he, he, I knew I was going to get beaten up and that was it. Every time he walked in the house, I used to shake. Um, I don't know what's happened in an argument and he got me into the corner of the kitchen and he grabbed a knife. And I know once he really, really shoved me in the kitchen and um, the corner clink on the old cabinet. Um, went right into my back and cut all my back, but the home became in the way. Architectural literature often describes the home as a haven, a castle beyond closed doors. However, this viewpoint has been reconsidered since the 2020 national lockdown. With the rise in offences of domestic abuse across 80% of England, the, pro the process of temporary lockdown and permanent increase to home working has turned the haven into an epicentre of threat as abuse has become veiled by bricks and mortar. As a result, this project retrofits existing social housing as a post-domestic abuse response for survivors fleeing their homes. Of domestic abuse. Intended to question the role architecture plays in the recovery of the survivor, the project rethinks architectural triggers and proposes spatial support through the design of new happenings. Acknowledging abuse itself as wholly the responsibility of the perpetrator, this project firstly questions what role architecture has played in the events of domestic abuse, and secondly, what role architecture is able to play as a support in the process of recovery for the abuse survivor. Having personally conducted interviews with survivors and experts, I became aware to the extent at which abuse takes place even within my own neighborhood. With interviews established through the Next Door app and further through word of mouth, the project became a long-term study as opposed to a 12-month student thesis. Working closely with the survivor to question the role that architecture has in domestic abuse. There were times when my partner would lock me in the house and take the keys with him. I couldn't get to work and consequently lost my job. My partner would often force me up against the walls. I'm not able to be specific about where because it happened so often. He would punch holes through the walls and the doors and tell me to repair them because they were my fault. The doors became a weapon in the home. He would use them to jam my arms so tightly it felt like they were broken. He would throw plates at my head, along with other objects, making a mess, and then would expect me to tidy it up. He would never help with the house. When he got angry, he would take out one of his knives to play with it, knowing this would scare me. One time he held a butterfly knife to my neck. I would sit on the edge of the sofa so that I could see when he returned. I wouldn't move when he hurt me. I didn't want him to feel like he had won. Into interviews with survivors speak of a series of architectural fragments used in abuse. Made evident through 3D reconstructions, these conversations have been translated into a spatial reading in order to clearly correlate the, co the common trends of how the home has been used as a weapon. Although not the cause of abuse, the inseparable link between the home and abuse trauma has become a pertinent subject for the architect. The balustrade used to break ribs, Heat sources used to burn hands and kitchen counters used to cut open the back of survivors are just a few accounts told in conversation. Additionally, interviews highlighted the importance that neighbourhood has on escape, evident through one interviewee being continually beaten she climbed out of her, out of her apartment onto the scaffolding to a neighbour's flat. She returned home where the abuser had been hiding in the loft. She fled again to the neighbour who contacted the police and made an arrest. Historically, refuge shelters provide short-term support, 
However, a shortage in permanent housing has meant the overcrowded shelter is refusing entry. In 2021, the UK government responded with the Domestic Abuse Act, giving priority to the survivor into social housing. Nevertheless, with no spatial criteria, the Act excludes the architect from the conversation through its terminology and definitions. Consequently, social housing as a long-term solution for many is ill-favoured or even worse than staying with the abuser. Social housing typologies reveal the inappropriate spatial conditions for post-abuse with the terrace triggering through public windows, the low-rise by sterile stairway stairways and hard surfaces, and the high-rise through thick concrete walls and disjointed public views. Social housing as a response is currently delaying recovery. In line with the Domestic Abuse Act, this project proposes a retrofit to existing housing according to a scale of funding. The materials and building methods reduce costs and constru construction time, allowing for the proposal to become an economically viable option. The proposal is designed to allow local authorities to working up to four different capacities. From fabrication through to fragments of urban recovery, the proposal creates social overlaps within existing neighborhoods. The domestic space supports gradual recovery in the existing building through retrofits such as the balcony as the first moments of leaving the home, the design of non-typical windows and split-level staircases supports a feeling of safety for those with PTSD, and further the shared kitchen learns from existing shelters, enabling conversation with the adjoining neighbour having experienced similar events of abuse. The project is set out to support the recovery of those affected by abuse However, in turn, the design re-engages with the existing community of social housing. Using height as a threshold for safety, on-site shared facilities such as allotments, swimming centres and the creche provide alternative routines within the existing estate to support the process of recovery through engagement, retrofitting the existing building and rooftop to better enable social crossovers. Each estate works with already established stakeholders alongside local authorities as I've already contacted, and the project responds at both small and large scales. Prior to construction, the design process offers a one-to-one -one built fragment as a tool for further conversation. The one-to-one -one re-engages with the survivor to discuss a life post-abuse. The interviews are not researching the survivor, but researching with the survivor, using their voice as an integral part to the design process. Responding to a national problem by building on three main typologies in keeping with the permitted development rights, making use of community infrastructures, mapping relevant housing according to supportive networks. I like to come out here in the mornings, see what's going on outside. He's already up and out, and then head back in, start the day. There is a real parallel between light and progress. I feel like I'm finally starting to get back to a sense of normality, at least a new kind of normal. I feel best when my mind is busy and doing something. When I'm alone at home, things always seem much harder. So I come out here, mainly to occupy my mind, to help forget and to also start something new, spending time with my neighbours. We go to the crash twice a week. It's an hour or two where she's happy playing with her friends and I can just unwind with a cup of tea along with any other parents that want to stay.
the evenings are nicest for me. When the kids have gone to bed, I'll come and just sit here for a bit and lose track of time watching the city lights. It makes me feel hopeful, and I like that. I like feeling like that. As architecture that provides the stage set for domestic abuse and provides the tools of violence for abuse, architecture gives the abuser the privacy and power to perpetrate their violence, and it is architecture that casts the characters of abuser, abused, and the peripheral retessant neighbor. Therefore, it's imperative to question the role of architecture within domestic abuse, and consequently the role it must play to become an architectural antonym, transitioning the house for the survivor from a place of violence to a home of refuge. Um, so just to uh, finish up with a few thoughts, kind of finishing the studies, um, and a few thoughts, uh, and a few kind of behind the scenes of how I produced the work. Um, the process that I used um, began through talking with people. It was through conversations with social housing tenants, and then particularly a conversation with the mother of a girl in the youth group that I led, um, that then led me to the study into the lives of survivors of domestic abuse and the role that architecture can play. The aim of my work is always to use the skills of the architect to help the lives of those around me. And I do this by working as collaboratively with the community as possible. The medium I used was to involve the stories of real people as much as possible. So as a result, I chose to blur the boundaries between real footage and storytelling devices to present the project. Working a lot with green screen imagery and conversations with survivors to tell their story using the tools of the architect. Um, receiving honours as an award, just to say, has reassured me that this project has a purpose and a meaning that people care about. It gave me the confidence to continue the project since finishing the fifth year and allowing the research to step deeper into the lives of those affected by domestic abuse. The award has also enabled me to realise that the method methodology is valued within the school and as a result I will be addressing some of these approaches within the CMS course this year, whilst also applying for funding to continue the project since finishing the fifth year. Um, also, just to use this time um, to say that I owe a massive thank you to the school um, for supporting the work and helping me culminate the project through the years that I've studied here. Um, and just to say that, like a lot of you, are at the first stages of quite a number of years of study, um, but the work that you do now shapes every year that you go forwards and forwards, and ultimately it shapes how you want to um, be as a designer. Um, and then the one piece of advice um, that I'd say is to speak to as many people as possible, both within the walls of the AA, which has a great network, and within the realm of architecture, um, but then also people outside of the realm of architecture and seeing them um, as the real experts within these projects. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is James Emery. I did Diploma 12 with manager in Inigo Mins. And the project's really a culmination, a bit like what Thomas was saying, of uh, since I started the AA, I kind of developed ideas. I was really interested in the idea of change and transformation in architecture, um, particularly uh, in the knowledge of how many practices uh, in the world operate. It's this sort of... Um, they think of architecture as more of a static thing that should be built and then remain that way forever, and uh, which sort of is contrary to um, the ideas of sort of entropy, where there's sort of everything is uh, energy is completely always being dissipated and eventually becomes heat, the most chaotic, one of the most chaotic states. And so the project really kind of works with trying to engage with that change of a building gradually becoming more chaotic and how that can uh, create more sustainable solutions for the future. Um, and so this quote is by Donna Haraway, and she's sort of talking, I mean, my interpretation of this text is she's talking about that kind of 
thinking of embracing the troubles and the chaos of the world around us and using that to propel us into the future. Um, the presentation is a video, um, so yeah. is 13.8 billion years old, unmeasurably big and expanding. Life first emerged on Earth 4.28 billion years ago. Humans have only been in existence for the last 300,000 years. We are yet to discover life anywhere else. Human action rooted in an instinctual drive for dominance and control is becoming deadly. As is well known, this is causing unprecedented biodiversity losses, severely threatening the existence of all life on Earth. Learning to change our behavior is a difficult challenge, but now our survival vitally depends on it. In 1990, the French philosopher Michel Serre put forward his notion of a natural contract to symbiosis, in which our relationship to things would set aside mastery and possession in favour of admiring attention, reciprocity, contemplation and respect. Post-human theories such as this share a common understanding that the key to our survival is to surrender our dominant drive for control, to decenter ourselves and recognise our dependence on the contingent and interdependent planetary ecosystem of which we are a part. The incredibly vast scale and intricate nature of this system infer that even the smallest actions can cause large and unpredictable consequences for any number of biotic and abiotic entities. Hierarchies dissolve as all things exist on a flat ontology. As architects, this implies that as we design the world for ourselves, we are simultaneously, unconsciously, designing the world for non-humans as well. No longer can we afford to design as if we exist in isolation. We need to decenter the human client in favor of wider ecological integration. But given the impossibility of ever knowing exactly how non-humans experience the world, how tenable is it to design for them? How can an architecture work at multiple scales and time spans appropriate for non-human life? And, given the vast interdependencies of the system, which non-humans deserve more attention than any other. The City of London serves as a microcosm of the global ecological and existential crisis, with the lowest biodiversity levels in the UK. This lack of biodiversity, compounded by the relentless spread of the city's infrastructure and rising human population, is increasing flood risk, heat island microclimates and pollution levels, all of which are at critically dangerous levels for human health. 2,997 brownfield sites, covering 26.42 kilometers squared of land, form some of the last havens for non-human biodiversity. Although these sites may appear vacant to the casual human eye, these sites are teeming with life. The large expanses of bare, heat-retaining concrete provide crucial habitats for at least 15% of the UK's nationally scarce invertebrates, including the streaked bombardier beetle the distinguished jumping spider, and the brown-banded cardaby. Since the ecological importance of these sites is not widely understood, they are constantly under threat from fly-tipping and heavy housing developments for a city already 18 times more crowded than any other in the UK. Recognising the urgent value high biodiversity levels hold, this project seeks to safeguard these brownfield sites as ecological reserves by the erection of anti-human wall systems. Comprising three typologies, 
the wall structures are positioned according to wind load and monitored traffic levels. A perforated wall for animal and plant access. A more protective wall to guard against heavy traffic levels and wind loads. And a building typology for human intervention. The walls would be constructed over a year from an unstabilized rammed earth composite sourced from within the brownfield sites themselves, reducing transport and manufacturing pollutants and the associated costs. Designed apertures in the wall would allow the free passage of plant and animal life to enter the sites at will. Embedded within the wall structure would be an adaptable building for human use one part used by ecologists to analyze and learn from the emergent urban wildlife developing within the sites, and the other to provide a space for the general public to observe and learn from the ecologists about the importance brownfield sites hold for biodiversity levels. Plants provide the foundation on which all other living things depend. By reducing human access, the wall system is really allowing space for plants transported by wind, birds and mammals to spontaneously grow through the process of ecological succession. Biodiverse habitats comprising a wide range of living things will emerge and transform as biodiversity increases over a period of roughly 200 years. We're talking about 200 years, but we're actually not sure because no one's ever really monitored anything that's been left to degrade. So it is what urban ecologists need because what we don't have is that baseline data on how long does succession take. Let's just see. Due to the inherent unpredictability of this project, the buildings themselves are designed to be adaptable, employing modular building techniques to allow for change and evolution. Let's be the pioneers, let's be the new explorers just watch on our doorstep. Within the reserves, as the ecologists carry out their essential work, guided walks along demarcated paths offer the public the opportunity to experience the variety of emergent life firsthand. Over the course of the first 50 to 60 years, as ecological succession takes hold, first lichens neutralize the concrete, allowing mosses to settle. These then form surface soils for pioneer ruderal plants to break the ground with their root systems, making way for larger secondary successional plant species, all the while forming more resilient levels of biodiversity. We're not preserving the past. We want the future to take over. Outside the reserves, over a period of 70 to 100 years, natural erosion from wind and rain allow openings in the walls to emerge at specifically choreographed locations, forming gateways for free human access as the sites reach resilient levels of biodiversity. Now that the sites are no longer under restricted access, Designed adaptability allows the buildings to freely change program. These might range from provision for local businesses, short stay accommodation, or gathering spaces for human and non-human life. As time moves on, the agency of the architect dwindles as the vitality of the ecosystem shifts the site's identities moment to moment. The process of ecological succession becomes the architect. Continuing towards a climax habitat, projected to be reached 200 years from the time of building, the rammed earth wall structures would disintegrate, welcoming ever larger non-humans into the sites as the soil from the walls re-enters the biogeochemical cycle of which it is integral. As the walls disintegrate, the plant and animal life within the sites gain increased agency to spread to nearby green corridors. As these biodiverse reservoirs develop across London, they form part of a green network, 
prizing open the space urgently needed for non-human inhabitation. habitation. If everything has equal value in a flattened ontology, it becomes impossible to avoid negative impact. To this end, the project itself is less concerned with finding architectural resolve, believing this to be impossible, and rather proposes the development of a practice positioning the architect as a mediator between the human and non-human worlds. This calls for the architect to embrace uncertainty in partnership with the processes of ecological succession to think in extended periods of time regarding the succession of the material and social structures we put in place. The architect's agency will always cede to the processes of ecological succession. Isn't it time we embrace that? Um, so my advice with like for diploma honors um, I never expected to get diploma honors and I remember also being in this room in third year the, my first year at the school and it was quite intimidating to see these presentations um, but it was also very inspiring and um, I hope this can be inspiring to some people here um, I think it's definitely not something you should aim for in a sense diploma honors I think it more should encourage um, you to be disciplined, but also to have fun at the same time. And I think if you can do those things in this school, that's the kind of the best you can achieve. And the diploma honors is a nice thing to receive, but it doesn't really, it's not something to overly fetishize, I think. Um, yeah. Also, I think the advice Tom had about talking to as many people as you can in the school is great. That really helped me a lot. Everyone is so willing to help here with any problems or issues you have. I've had amazing support. Um, so yeah, thank you. Hi guys, um, I'm sure you guys are just starting off and a bit stressed about your years ahead in the school, but I'll tell you one thing, it's probably gonna be the most exciting times of your life, so just enjoy it. And I'm just gonna start off by showing you my project, which has been a culmination of a study of domesticity over a few years at the school, and uh, it culminated with a project about public housing uh, in Karachi. So the project is titled Avoid, Reintroducing the Patio to Karachi in which I observed the city through the dwelling type and its ability to provide respite in a dense urban fabric. The project uses the patio as a void space for mediation during both the building and inhabitation of a public housing scheme in Karachi. In order to interpret this void, I would like to discuss how housing has homogenized itself into a debate of autonomy and governance in the building environment. This discourse is divided into two major philosophies. The first, a top-down approach advocating centrality, and the second, a bottom-up promoting forms of self-governance. While critical of both extremes, my project questions whether the excess or the lack of choice results in a burden rather than a liberty and situates itself in between these two philosophies, where choice is limited to taking decisions that matter. It interrogates the unresolved relationship between a state-led initiative and a self-governing system where the role of the architect is the designer of a framework rather than specifics. The project is located in Karachi, a city of 22 million residents, of which 50% live in squatter settlements known as Kachi Abadis. It is home to the largest labor opportunities in Pakistan and consequently has a housing demand of 100,000 units with a bottleneck of approximately 6 million units that are considered inadequate. This demand is predominantly being met through the densification of dilapidated squatter settlements in the city center, 
or the expansion of new ones on the periphery of the city. Through the undressing of the Kachiyabadi, my research would like to make evident the formality behind what is often considered informal, suggesting that even in a bottom-up approach, there is no sense of complete autonomy. The success of the Kachiyabadi can be narrowed down to two actors, the middlemen, known as the Dalal, and the material supplier, referred to as the Thalwala. They have designed a method enabling housing to be scalable, replicable, and affordable. The Lals can be interpreted as the urban planners behind this form of housing. They first grab state land through political affiliation and bribes, subdivided into 60 plots per acre, in which subdivisions are as dense as possible to accumulate maximum revenue. They do this through a method of demarcation using the cement block, enclosing plots that are to be built within, resulting in a master plan. The scale and speed of construction is aided by the prefabrication process run by the Talwalas, who are considered to be the architects of the dwelling typology. They manage the prefabrication yards that provide material, knowledge, and labor for housing. Operating on an empty plot of land, they produce precast concrete elements and are frequent across all neighborhoods of the city. This process of prefabrication is essential to the replicability, scalability of these and scalability of these settlements. And through this formal framework, these actors have managed to house over 50% of the population. This procedure, though highly efficient, lays out a sequence of problems. The first is the unregulated privatization and commodification of state land. The second is the ability of the current dwelling type to adapt to different forms of living. And lastly is the settlement's morphology, which does not provide public spaces for social interaction, forcing inhabitants to use alleyways or remain indoors. At this point, I would like to mention, in Pakistan, the state itself does not have sufficient funds to construct large-scale social housing from initiation to completion. And hence, I propose a division in agency between three actors. The state, who acts as an enabler and a planner. The supplier, or thalla, who produces and sells prefabricated elements. And the inhabitant, who simply takes decisions on living. As a planner, the state lays out three initiatives that represent the scheme. The first is to provide affordability, one that disconnects land from exchange value. The ownership of a single plot is divided between four entities, in which each entity owns a 25% share to form a micro-cooperative. This can be four individuals or a single extended family that pay installments over a 20-year period to receive ownership. However, this piece of land can only be resold through the state where they undergo a rigorous process to identify those in need. The second in initiative by the state is to transform the existing typology by empowering the Thalwala. The current prefabrication type of load-bearing walls is reformed to a system of precast columns, making it durable to densification and accommodating for a multiplicity of dwelling needs. The typology is designed on a 100-meter square plot in which a third of the plot remains void as an outdoor patio. The other two thirds is a grid structure composed of 12 columns. The state provides a manual to the prefabrication yard, describing a step-by-step -step process on how to cast and erect elements in this structure, which is designed to be straightforward, minimizing training required for the local laborer. It is composed of columns, beams, and slabs, and in order to decrease the variety of prefabricated elements, the column and beam are intended to be the same piece with equal dimensions. Columns can be added on existing floors, allowing the structure to grow incrementally where families or individuals can extend bays and add floors when needed. All elements are sized to be maneuvered through local transport, mitigating expensive costs. However, the rigidity of the structure is mirrored by the flexibility of the interior, which proposes a new form of domestic space. The existing compartmentalization of specific rooms is challenged by the equalizing the size of the rooms, taking away the sense of pre predefined hierarchy. The typology is split into three strips, an enclosed interior, a semi-outdoor veranda, and an outdoor patio on the ground floor. The wet core is always located in the same bay. The single pixel has hollow partitions and can provide up to two bathrooms and a single kitchen. The veranda is designed to be a void within the interior a space that can expand or retract based on how people choose to live, a space left to be determined. This definition is made possible through a user's manual on the threshold. All interior partitions are op operate with a metal frame, 
permitting the inhabitant to decide on the type of boundary they require. This frame slots into the concrete structure along the grid of the unit, where the use of openable partitions delineates the threshold into a collective space, while fixed partitions use the grid to create privacy. At the scale of the plot, four units share a common utility shaft, along with the common staircases, turning circulation space into a moment of encounter and interaction. These collective elements tolerate for units to expand horizontally, allowing for a variation of domestic lifestyles no longer restricted by structural partitions. This typology is repeated at the scale of the block, in which there are 100 plots that can accommodate four stories each. The concentration is the same as that of the existing, of the existing city fabric. However, the addition of the patio offers a relief within this density. At this point, I'd like to address the relevance of the patio and specifically why it has been important to me and the culture of Pakistan. It is a space that has been historically relevant in the region since the time of the Indus Valley civilization, where they used a series of different levels for public gathering. It is still common today across the rural setting of the country, where a diversity of domestic programs are located in outdoor spaces, offering a semi-private realm for social exchange, specifically for women and children. Unfortunately, Due to the densification in the city center, this space has been erased in Karachi. And through the restoration of this void, my proposed typology provides a sanctuary to those lost domestic rituals, where activities spill outdoors into the semi-private space, one that allows for a divided agency. As units grow vertically, the patio expands upwards onto neighboring rooftops, creating the urban as an extension of the domestic realm. The lifestyle is no longer limited by threshold but is instead a negotiation between the interior and exterior, the private and public, and domestic and city. On the ground floor, it is a niche for women and children to find refuge within their home. On the first floor, it becomes a sacred space for an evening prayer. This brings me to the third act by the state, which is the, making of their territory, which is the marking of their territory before it is encroached. Unlike the Dalal, who forms enclosures allocating space of where to build, the state will mark their land through the space of the void, a space of where not to build. The void is a series of urban patios that exist at three scales, depending on the size of state land available within the city. At the level of the block, a single platform is allocated for tea stalls to emerge, cultivating a local gathering, and two platforms are allocated for playgrounds. The neighborhood scale accommodates up to 900 plots, where a space for local, a local mosque can be used for congress, congressional prayers. Linear voids form markets for ad hoc cart vendors, and two platforms are dedicated to the thalla for the prefabrication of the homes. These urban platforms abrupt the rigidity of the neighborhood, delivering a respite for inhabitants. The scale of the settlement is at which the pilot project takes place. It is on, the par it is on a parcel of land on the periphery of the city that is surrounded by growing squatter settlements. Here, the urban patio is used as a method of distinction to differentiate state land. The settlement's largest platforms include a grand bazaar, a jama masjid, and a cricket field. The edge is planted with trees to limit endless growth and distinguishes an area for communal activities. Barren land is no longer left for middlemen to commercialize. As people move in, infrastructure is placed, platforms come to life, and homes are erected. As density increases, the urban patio remains void to use for public amenities, bringing children together for play as a pause within the settlement. Entering the home, a ground floor patio visually connects neighbors where a child playing cricket is hidden from the construction next door. On the second floor, the rooftop is used as a patio, allowing the inhabitant a view of other such spaces in the neighborhood. Partitions open, merging the veranda and patio into a single space. The urban transforms into a varied yet uniform tapestry where patios, rooftops, blur into moments of refuge, creating inhabitable voids within a field of homes. In conclusion, I'd like to emphasize the importance of the void, both at the scale of the type and the settlement, which make evident its ability as a space to adjust and adapt, but not be completely redefined. A space that the architect includes in their design to provide a space of divided agency. Thank you. Yeah, so once again, I'd like to reiterate what Thomas and James said. 
that I think the best way to learn over here is to interact with the students and ask questions about what is going on within the school. And what you'll realize is that you learn more from the students around you than the teachers. Manija is smiling here because she's a tutor herself, but it's kind of the, a common truth. And I think just uh, go along with the process and enjoy it. That's it. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Tetsuya, and it's okay, I'm the last one, so 10 more minutes to go. I hope you enjoy it. My project is Across the Wall. On February 2nd, 2022, the UK government has published its Leveling Up the United Kingdom white paper, an extensive document proposing 12 missions under four objectives to address and narrow the economic and social disparities across the country, noted to be the largest around the world. The 12 missions cover a wide range of factors, including larger investments in rural areas in order to restore a sense of community, leveling up skills, boosting productivity, and increasing housing ownership and improving housing qualities with the target of 300,000 new homes per year in England. Although the proposal still remains controversial, the collection of research presents the importance of improving the disparity across the country. It is not merely a political act, but can also be seen as an opportunity to reimagine our everyday life through alternative architectural approaches for living collectively in a rural condition. The project would explore this notion by introducing a new horticultural community in a former coal field where their social, economic, and community of not had been loosened by the closure of mining facilities in the early 2000s. By reimagining the clean, the intimate, the exposed, the hot and cold, the alternative way of collecting living would bridge the gap between the sensorial atmosphere and the social action. According to the UK Coal Authority, one quarter of the population of our country lives in a coal field where a majority are under economic deprivation and population aging ever since the closure of the mining production. The project is situated in West Cumbria, a former cold field in north northwest England adjacent to the coastal town Whitehaven. With a history of mining production, the site is currently a brownfield with remains of concrete and tarmac slabs from the past. In 2007, the local authority announced a future plan to regenerate the mining production However, with numbers of protests by the locals, the plan still remains paused. As a counter-proposal counter to this planning, the project would explore the idea of horticulture as an intervention for boosting productivity and restoring a sense of community in a formal mining site. The history of kitchen gardens first appeared in Britain in the Roman era. By 17th century, the interest to harvest more diverse range of fruits and vegetables led to the invention of various passive heating techniques, enabling products originated in the Mediterranean area to be grown in various climate conditions. With this method, numbers of regions across Europe successfully became a recognized area for horticultural production, despite their severe climate condition. These communities involved various trades other than horticulturists, such as carpenters and plumbers, in order to maintain their orchards within their own neighborhood. The project would reimagine this relationship between horticulture and collective living by introducing an alternative wall system creating a landscape of dwelling and fruit production. The landscape consists of two wall typologies, an active heating wall running from north to south, 
and a passive heating wall running from west to east. The active heating wall uses the geothermal heat from the abandoned mining water existing underground of West Cumbria Mining, located in the north edge of the site. The passive heating walls would apply the fruit wall method, capturing the radiation heat during the daytime and slowly releasing it to the other side in the nighttime. These two wall types are built in various distances in order to create variety of microclimate condition for different products grown across the site. By using the top soil from the site, the rammed earth walls would contribute to the remediation of the contaminated ground condition. In reaction to the spoon-shaped topography, the walls are constructed to be the same level, creating a new horizon across the site. By keeping the wall height consistent, depending on the location, the wall height would become a suitable place for congregation, or a height creating an inhabitable space. The roofs for the homes are sunken to not disturb the sunlight reaching to the garden space. And in locations where the topography further deepens, Camino programs are organized with an atmosphere with a higher, higher ceiling. The geothermal walls are fringed, avoiding the concrete remains, having the passive heating walls woven between, creating various conditions for both indoor and outdoor programs. 99 homes are divided into three clusters. The east cluster most active during the warm seasons, producing summer fruits at their, new out, at their outdoor fields. The south cluster maintaining citrus products suitable to be grown in indoor greenhouses and orangeries in cold seasons and the North Cluster responsible for smaller scale productions and garden spaces scattered around the area. The three clusters additionally share larger production fields, which are connected by the main distribution line led to the factory, where harvested fruits are processed into marketable products for the public market. Social programs are located between the clusters as a framework for the civic life in sight and the pivotal strip on the east becomes an opportunity for further civic and economic development, acting as a connection with the existing settlement. The variety of production in both scale and seasons create an interdependency between three clusters, and the production flow would influence the existing settlement around the site, gradually transforming the entire neighborhood into a market town. Looking into the formation of clusters, a loop circulation is organized having squares or courtyard spaces branching out in order to reach to each home. Both the circulation and squares occasionally run through individual garden spaces or workshops to allow interactions between the inhabitants in their everyday life. The passive heating walls woven between the active heating walls form a variety of fragmented spaces across the cluster. Variations of homes are composed through combining these fragments of spaces allowing inhabitants with different trades and lifestyle to come together. In some homes, room would be connected through a passage, demonstrating the experience of compaction and expansion of space from getting to the bedroom from the living room. In other case, the home would bridge across the public outdoor space, having the inhabitant to reach their bathroom by once getting out from their individual territory. Each threshold between homes would be reshaped depending on the composition, sometimes forming shared gardens or communal workshops where inhabitants ex exchange knowledge and skills. The boundary between the working space and their home is blurred by inviting the outdoor ground condition inside, reconceptualizing the idea of clean and dirty. Three typologies for the openings would create a living environment with a continuous engagement with the outdoor through visual and physical connectivity. The openings would allow an interaction between rooms and gardens or form a larger space for communal activities, both indoor and outdoor. The gardens would always become present in the inhabitants' everyday life. The sound and the smell of the working activity would leak out from the home. Through the hybridization of active and passive heating, the walls become a congregational place rather than a threshold. The warmth of the active heating wall would congregate activities from both indoor and outdoor. The passive heating walls would also function as a wall where the excessive heat from one's domestic activity could become exchangeable, sometimes feeding warmth for the plants or their neighbors. 
In large indoor spaces, the interior configuration shifts depending on the outdoor temperature, where in winter indoor activities might rely on the periphery of the room more than the summer. Domestic activities will spill out from the home in warmer seasons, forming a congregational moment with the neighbors under the sun. The home is no more an enclosed box with a steady state condition throughout the year, but becomes open to the seasonal and climatic shift, encouraging the domestic activities to become responsive to the outdoor environment. One would share his afternoon with a neighbor at his window still, over a cup of tea and an orange picked in the morning. Homes share garden spaces with their neighbors, sometimes enjoying their lunch under one's peach tree in summer. Blocks share communal workshops where tools, skills, and knowledge would be exchanged between different inhabitants. It would share a seasonal feast to celebrate their harvest in the spring, and an indoor communal space for gatherings in the winter. Different clusters would, would share the communal field, a moment to interact with inhabitants living far across the site through harvesting. The horticultural community would share one single infrastructure, a landscape of thermal walls running across the entire site. One might be sharing a wall with someone living 900 meters away. The single gesture of configurating thermal walls would loosely connect the entire site, restoring the sense of collectiveness through horticultural production. The variation of homes and hierarchy of sharing allows people with different trades and lifestyle to come together and the domestic activities to respond to the seasonal shift. The landscape of fruit production in 99 homes would propose an alternative way of collective living where the conventional notion of work and home, individual and share, warm and cold, and intimate and distant is reconceptualized across the wall. Thank you. Thank you to the five of you for uh, such different but equally brilliant presentations. And uh, yeah, I guess uh, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand because we are also live streaming this on YouTube. So we have to bring you the microphone so they can hear you online. Um, but they will answer your questions, not me. Please, can you guys come up? Hi, uh, I, hello. I had a question for the project on the uh, domestic abuse survivors. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Thomas. Thomas. Uh, so, I mean, uh, there is a stark uh, imagery that is sort of created uh, for the various timelines that you presented. Uh, when the victim was being abused, there was a certain visual rendition that was there and when the victim had, was a survivor, there was a certain visual rendition that the design presents. Uh, and uh, that sort of alludes to a identity formation as far, the way, as, far as I see it. So uh, what I wanted to ask is, uh, while the project uh, or, uh, you know, during the initial stages when the occupants are occupying the space, they are survivors. You know, the identity formed is, I am a survivor. Mm -hmm. But how does the project evolve or respond once the identity transforms into, I have survived, and now it's time to move on? Do they just abandon the project, or how does it, how does the space operate? Is there a flux between the various typologies that you talked about? How does that happen? Yeah. Um, so it's a good question. Um, something that I probably could have put even more thought into um, during the year. But when speaking with um, survivors of domestic abuse, um, it, it appears to me that there isn't a, a point, now I may be wrong in saying this, but at least with the people I spoke to, there isn't a point where there's 
I am a survivor to I have survived. Um, they're always living with the trauma that they've experienced. Um, and then one of the things the project is addressing is to basically prevent architecture from becoming a trigger um, to potentially something that happened many years ago. But I also, within the project, the design for survivors is also very much a case of um, just considerate design for, for human life. Um, so that means it's about a lot of natural light, it's a lot of biophilia, it's about social interactions and creating new happenings for people um, to develop new lifestyles. And so the project doesn't come to an end when a person feels like they've recovered. They would still be within that site, unless, of course, they, they chose to go elsewhere. Um, but the project enables a space for recovery to, to happen, um, no matter what stage someone is at. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much again for presenting.